I just realized that sounds like a lot more than anyone can possibly be doing. Um, and with these things, you should always take them with a barrel of salt. Uh, we always have like good intentions to think, finish things, which we never do. Um, and in, in fact, uh, what I'm going to be discussing today um, is attached to something which I started many years ago and never finished. Um, my first project after I finished my PhD was going to be a, a study of time and creation in Islamic thought, uh, which produced two articles, the last one of which came out in 2006, uh, and then I, I basically gave up. Um, partly because, as, as Alan mentioned before, you know, the, the famous quotation from Augustine, and the fact that uh, the more you read about time, uh, and particularly the paradoxes of time, the more you realize you have absolutely no idea what time is. Um, I'm going to um, start off with saying a few things about what we've already discussed, which is that in some ways there's a dissonance between our kind of everyday empirical understanding and experience of time and uh, a more metaphysical reflection. So we've already talked about the fact that we measure time in different ways, we use clocks, uh, we number the passing of time, we have lots of technologies uh, for doing so, um, uh, including watches, which I, I never actually have a watch. And uh, I guess I have my phone here, I can check what time it is, but if I am going massively over time, please do shout uh, and just tell me. Uh, one of my pet hates is rooms which don't have clocks. Uh, so I have no idea how long I've been speaking for, um, because of course one of the features of speaking and being in the moment is that it's timeless. Uh, and it's very difficult for an individual to really guess whether they've been speaking for five minutes, one minute, or even an hour at times. So please do, uh, do shout if I'm going massively over. So there, there's a sense in which time is something that happens to us, it's kind of fleeting, it's considered to be a resource. You mentioned time is money. Well, time is also a fundamental resource. We're told not to waste time, to use time wisely, to be economical with time, and so forth. And then there are extensions of those empirical understandings of time, which relate to how um, people of faith, in particular, um, punctuate their day and their life. And this is what I would call uh, experiencing time as timings. So sort of timings, for example, of prayer, uh, timings uh, which relate to uh, calendrical things uh, uh, in the months of the year and so forth, uh, particular points in the week uh, of, of ritual significance and so forth. I'm not going to primarily be talking about those things. There is, if you're, if you're interested in things like calendars, uh, there is a particularly bad book, uh, which is called A Time in, in Islam which tells you about those sorts of things. Um, things like calendars, uh, when does the Hijri calendar start, and things like that. What I'm going to be talking about is what I'm more interested in. Uh, I'm primarily trained as an intellectual historian. I'm interested in the course of philosophy, so a lot of what I will have to say much uh, uh, lies really in, in philosophy and uh, philosophical theology, and relates to what I, I call a metaphysical conception of time, which in its essence, basically tells us certain things about how we see God and how we see the human and the particular interactions between uh, those two and of course how we, we see the cosmos, uh, the sort of three realities classically of, of, of thought um, and in particular the relationship between time and creation. Um, I will, however, and this is uh, in, the, in Islamic thought, this is particularly called the uh, the problem, so to speak, of Hudud al-Alam, um, the creation or the incipience of the cosmos, um, and how that might relate, for example, to uh, the, the question of the eternality, either of the cosmos and, of course, uh, of God. Um, I will start with some uh, comments about how concepts of temporality uh, emerge in scriptural texts. And then what I will do is I will try to, and this is how I was thinking of structuring the chapter, uh, crazy idea of trying to do a survey of concepts of time in Islam, but anyway, uh, the first uh, section is broadly going to be about uh, three Hellenist, uh, Hellenic models of understanding time and eternity, which I will dwell on a bit. Uh, the second one is um, 
uh, some notions within the Sufi tradition of, of timelessness and experiences of timelessness, which I think are really interesting um, and have been discussed already by someone like um, Gerhard Berbering in a couple of very important articles. Uh, the third one, which I, I do hope to develop for the paper, is going to be on some uh, Shi'i notions of time, um, where uh, time is cyclical uh, in, in some very significant ways, and uh, even has sort of cycles of completion and renewal. Uh, and the final one uh, would be some modern engagements in, in contemporary 20th century Muslim thought, uh, with two types of um, um, uh, modern cosmological ideas, uh, one being uh, the general theory of relativity, how that's been received by some thinkers, uh, and the other one uh, being the reception of uh, Henri Bergson's um, concept of duration, uh, particularly in uh, forms of Muslim existentialism and uh, what's called personalism. So that's the, the kind of crazy menu, uh, which um, I hope I will try to deliver in the paper. But let me start with some concepts of time, uh, temporality, which uh, arise in the Qur'an and uh, the hadith corpus um, sayings of the Prophet and uh, in the Shi'i tradition of the Imams who succeed uh, the Prophet as well. And it's a theme which comes up in the, in the first instance, to a certain extent, in a a polemic, a dialectic with uh, pre-existing um, pre-Islamic notions of fate or time as an absolute. The, the term here, of course, used is dahr. Um, and so one has a lot of uh, uh, pre-Islamic poetry which talks about how humans are passive um, uh, victims of time, uh, of fate. There's very little they can do about it. They are constantly nostalgic about what has passed, but what has passed is something which has happened to them and they, haven't, they don't have much um, agency within that process. Uh, Dahar is something which um, happens uh, to them. Um, and uh, as I said, the, the, the element of the nostalgia of what has passed is in a sense a nostalgia of, of, of loss and of, um, of um, sort of things which uh, uh, one wishes one had done if one had a true agency. And uh, the poetry in particular tries to um, emphasize the, um, the punctuation of time through days and, and nights which pass and pondering over the, the nostalgia of what has passed. And it's very much fate which then determines life, human life, um, and not, for example, a demiurgic creator uh, who does this. And uh, one finds even uh, the continuities of that in some of the uh, poetry of the early Islamic period. You, you have the classical poets, uh, for example, in the Abbasid period who continue this sort of theme. And one finds elements of that even uh, uh, in, in the Quran. So in the Quran, one both has the sense in which um, it, it critiques uh, those who say, for example, um, uh, this life is all we have, it's this material ex um, existence and we, are, um, we, uh, we die and we live and nothing destroys us except for time. Uh, it's uh, a Quranic verse. Um, at the same time you have a, a re-thinking uh, of what this dahar is or this absolute time which then determines human life and relating it with God's agency. And so you have this rethinking of, of um, for example, God as the Lord of time, uh, of, of dahar, of, of fate. Um, it is uh, God who, for example, creates out of nothing. It's God who says be and it is. Uh, it's God who famously creates in six days. And I, I don't want to go into whether a day is a day is a day. Day is a day except when it does not mean a day. I'll leave it at that. Um, and, um, and even this kind of notion of, of, of fate, uh, as it's no longer considered to be something which is entirely abstract, it becomes again associated with, with, um, uh, with divine agency and divine decree in particular. Um, and so uh, the, the course of a human life is then uh, divided up into uh, creation, uh, a time uh, of trial and tribulation, of tests, um, of uh, whether a human will be uh, 
uh, grateful or not and then a final judgment at the end of a period and and this this notion of period comes up a lot of ajal that you know there is a certain uh, measure that is the human life um, and uh, again this is something which is very much in the hands of the divine um, the the ident identification of this kind of abstract time and that uh, with god is even made uh, clearer in a set of um, hadith which are quite famous in which the prophet is reported to have said that um, you know do not curse dahar or time uh, for that is a, a name of God or for that is God um, and then there are other types of ways in which um, in the scriptural corpuses um, you find corpora you find uh, the notion that the human experience of time is somewhat relative and um, inaccurate. So again, it comes back to what I was saying at the beginning, you know, who knows how long I've been speaking for. Um, in my view, it's maybe two minutes, it might be longer than that, it might be shorter than that. But the classic example given in the Quran is the sleepers of Ephesus, right? So the sleepers of Ephesus are made to sleep, to protect them, and then at one point uh, they wake up and they go into town and uh, they are then astounded to find out that hundreds of years have passed and they think they've been merely napping for a few uh, minutes. Uh, you have other examples of this in the Quran as well, that the, the basic sense that humans have of what has passed is very inaccurate in, in any sense where we're looking at time as an objective measure. Similarly, you have this, uh, this uh, uh, sort of lament of of those who reject um, in at judgment, sort of saying, oh, you know, it's um, it seems like it's uh, hasn't been very long. Um, if only you'd give us the chance to go back and sort of quickly uh, rectify our lives so that we can uh, deal with this this eternity which lies before us. And a lot of the the terms which are then used uh, are in the Quran and Hadith in particular are quite different from the terms which I will discuss in, in a few minutes or less. Um, there are things like, and a lot of the terms which are, particularly in the Quran, are about moments or instants. So for example, you have terms like uh, uh, waqt used, you have terms like uh, an used, you have terms like hain used, which are often considered to be the, the fleeting moment. And sometimes you have that fleeting mo uh, moment compared to the, the vast kind of stretch of time. Um, and that vast stretch is sometimes called Dahar, uh, and sometimes it's even called Asr. There's a famous short uh, chapter of the Quran towards the end, which is on, on Asr, and, and there's, of course, a whole debate about uh, what Asr means. But in all of these things, these particular moments and the, the, the expanse of time, are very much related to the human experience. So there's a very, uh, there is a, um, a chapter which is sometimes called Dahar, time, or sometimes it's called the human, which starts by saying, you know, have you not uh, con uh, considered, uh, you human, uh, humans, that um, was there ever a moment uh, in time, heen min al dahar, when you were not recollected or were you not mentioned? So. The expanse of time is one in which humans are, are remembered and recollected and recounted. So that's a particular frame. Um, and uh, one last uh, uh, term which I just want to quickly mention, which you find in the scriptural texts, is this concept of the hour, the sa'a. Um, and uh, it's often in an eschatological frame. So it's the idea of the hour that will come being uh, the judgment uh, that um, the the hour is something which is near uh, that the hour will be here uh, you know in a twinkling of an eye uh, and and so forth um, and uh, this this notion of um, the hour uh, as something to come um, which is near uh, relates to some both some apocalyptic uh, features of early Islam, but you find this coming back uh, later in, in more esoteric notions and, and particularly in Shi notions as well. Um, the third um, 
set of ideas you find in scripture, which I'll just mention very briefly, is the, the idea that uh, the days and the months are determined by, by God. So you have this, uh, this uh, uh, statement of the 12 months, there are 12 months with God. Uh, so that uh, the, the basic um, frame of some of the elements of the calendar, uh, like days, like 12 months, are not things which are purely conventionally constructed by humans, but somehow exist as an objective frame in which humans are placed. Now, <clears throat> coming to my first um, set of ideas, and these are ones which, um, in a sense, have already been mentioned. Um, and, and they re reflect uh, three, possibly four types of uh, inheritances from the Hellenic tradition. And these, just to quickly mention them, list them first, are the Platonic Plotinian notion of time and eternity, the Aristotelian the definitions of time and particularly the paradoxes of time, Again, as I said at the beginning, if you dwell too much on the paradoxes of time, you will convince yourself there is no such thing as time, and then time kind of bites back in some way. Um, you have a deadline coming up, and so forth. So there's like, a, it comes back to sort of ordinary language notions that, uh, yes, it's all very well saying that time doesn't exist, but when you have a deadline uh, to, and when you have to pick, you know, wake up your kids to go to school in the morning, um, and they reply to you, of course, time isn't real, um, you're really in trouble. Um, so um, there's the, the Platinian, Plat uh, Platonic notion, there's the Aristotelian notion, there is the atomic notion, which becomes quite important in, um, in uh, theological schools like the Ashadi school, and particularly the idea of a time atom, which I'm still really trying to get my head around what a time atom could be. Uh, interestingly, the main, the most coherent account, and it's a very short account of time atom, actually comes from Maimonides, which then begs the question of how old this concept really is um, uh, within the Islamic traditions, or whether it's something reflecting uh, what was available to him at the time. And, and then there's also this uh, notion of uh, time as one of the eternal entities. Um, and that, um, maybe I'll mention that first before I go back to the Platonic, is associated with the famous, uh, perhaps the most famous um, heretic in the early period, although I I'm, I'm wonder whether it's correct to call him a heretic. Uh, and this is Abu Bakr Razi, um, you know, who is basically posits uh, the existence of five eternal entities. Um, so you have God, um, you have time, and you have the universal soul, and so forth. So there's five entities which are entirely coeval and are eternal entities. And in that, um, time is one of them. Time is almost divinized in a sense, although there's a question about whether he's really doing that. And there's also a question about where it's coming from. Uh, one possibility is the ancient Iranian concept of Zurvan. Uh, another concept uh, which is mentioned in lots of doc doxographies and heresiographies is that he's getting it from some sort of strange pagans in Harran, which is in northern Syria. Uh, but since we know so very little about the pagans of Hadran, it's very difficult to know if um, there is anything uh, to that. So, um, coming back uh, to uh, the first of these um, concepts. The first one, as I said, is the Platonic one, which comes uh, ultimately from the Timaeus, and this famous uh, phrase of, of time as the mo moving image of eternity. And uh, in terms of the reception of uh, this, Platinian, uh, this Platonic uh, notion, uh, you have a, a cosmological hierarchy which is developed. So you have basically the kind of the, the highest ontological level of, of God, um, who ultimately is, is beyond time. And you've got the, the, the level of uh, the, the celestial spheres and the uh, the higher uh, intelligible entities which um, are everlasting uh, have, um, are at the level of dahar, uh, perpetuity, aeon. And then you have uh, the created uh, material cosmos which has a beginning uh, which is um, constituted by what we might call uh, your standard notion of time. Uh, 
And this uh, comes into uh, the Islamic period fairly early on. You already have, uh, by the third century, people um, showing uh, a, an awareness of it and also showing an awareness of these, that this con conception comes um, ultimately from Plato. Um, it's in the doxographies, um, famously a bit later, of course, in Shah who dies in 1153. There's a very detailed description of it, but it, it's there already in 9th century doxographies and histories of philosophy. And so then you have this uh, notion that Timaeus establishes a certain uh, model for how we understand the relationship between uh, time and eternity and how we can find a space for creation um, uh, uh, in uh, a reconciliation of, of Hellenic and um, uh, Islamic thought. The, one of the elements of this, and this is kind of a historical sort of side point, is that there are a lot of attestations that the Timaeus was translated into Arabic, but it has not survived, Whoa. which is a bit of a shame. Uh, but we have some fragments which survive, and we certainly have more of an Arabic translation of uh, Galen's um, um, uh, epitome uh, mm -hmm. or summary of, of the Timaeus, uh, which does survive. Um, but it's certainly mentioned in many texts that um, the Timaeus was translated. Um, and um, uh, of course, it was translated by Khomein uh, ibn Ishaq. Um, one of the interesting processes of the translation movement in, in early Islam is the fact that um, a lot of the translators, of course, are, are Christians who were involved and working together with uh, different uh, Muslims, and in certain cases, even pagan thinkers. One can think of uh, uh, Thabit ibn Qurra is a famous pagan uh, thinker of the early period who's involved in that. Um, and the most explicit uh, uh, thinkers who advocate the Platonic model uh, in the development of early uh, of Islamic thought probably are the Brethren of Purity, as they're called, the Ikhwan al Safa, um, in the um, in the tenth century, the the late ninth, early tenth century. Uh, in which there's a very explicit sense in which they are taking up the Platonic um, model. The second model, as I said, is the Aristotelian model, in which um, time is a, a number or a counting or a measuring of motion. It is not, strictly speaking, motion itself, um, and it's not, strictly speaking, just change itself. So it's part of the natural order. It's part of the physical uh, world. Um, and uh, the, as part of that, it's, it's uh, the, this notion that physics, uh, natural philosophy, is the study of natural order in which <clears throat> there are different natures which are changing and there are ways in which we can count the way uh, the change uh, is happening. Um, the, uh, the texts, of course, that people are referring to um, go back to physics um, 3 and 4 of Aristotle, and that's where uh, you not only have the definition of time which is given, you have it juxtaposed um, with um, uh, sp space and place, uh, you have it juxtaposed with the notion of change, and you also have it juxtaposed with these classic kind of paradoxes of um, the difference between time and parts of time, uh, which lead you to, as I mentioned in a sense before, the, the eternal now. Um, and uh, the eternal now is something which is then taken up by, um, by Avicenna in particular. So the basic point about the eternal now is that um, the different parts of time don't exist. The past is past, so it doesn't exist now. The future has not come to be. And the present um, cannot be characterized by change or by a, a number of emotion, quite simply, because once it's moved, then it's no longer the now. So there's no like before now and now now and after now. Um, they all uh, basically blur into the same. And so you end up with this paradox of there can be no such thing as time because the parts of time don't make sense. They don't, they don't, they're not um, congruent and they don't uh, exist at the same time at the same uh, moment. Uh, and uh, this, uh, th this paradox leads to um, all sorts of uh, commentaries on, on timelessness, um, which are quite kind of cool and, and mind-blowing in, in many levels, uh, just because, as I said, it does seem to think it lead you to the position where you're saying there really is no such thing as time, but then I guess, you know, as I said, 
you come up with the, the classic, um, I'm not going to school because it's not time for it, um, uh, paradox. Uh, now, um, within the, the reception of the Aristotelian model, you also have, um, despite the fact that Aristotle is usually uh, considered to be uh, the main reason for arguing for the, the eternity of the cosmos, uh, and especially in the way in which Avicenna receives them. So uh, there's a basic uh, paradox between, on the one hand, saying that the cosmos is finite, on the other hand, actually saying the cosmos does not have a moment at which it's created. Um, despite uh, this particular model, so the, the cosmos is only posterior to the divine in its essence or in a logical sense. Um, it's, it's contingent, but it's not created in time, it's not temporal as such. Um, despite that, you also had uh, the early reception by someone like Kindi, who uses um, the arguments about the, the finite nature of the cosmos um, to argue um, via Philoponus's famous arguments against Proclus um, that the world has to be created by its creator at a particular point and the, the cosmos actually is uh, temporal. To a large extent, the Aristotelian model gets bogged down in this debate between Proclus and, and Philoponus on whether um, the cosmos is created in time or not, whether does the cosmos have a beginning or not, which is <coughs> temporal and which can be measured. And of course, that has implications for how we see the nature of the divine. You know, is that God uh, creating at a particular point uh, which is emphasizing divine volition, or is there something which is entirely instrumental in a sense about the cosmos. And often those who advocated the eternity of the cosmos were accused of reducing God to a principle, an instrumental principle uh, without volition. So uh, this is one of the <coughs> points made, uh, for example, by Ghazali in his response to Avicenna, was precisely that, that, that um, the, the view of God which emerges from an eternal cosmos is incompatible with the choosing creating um, uh, deity. Um, and he also, one of the interesting things that Ghazali does, which is then taken up by much later thinkers, <coughs> is that he says, well, one of the ways you can get around this paradox of um, when does time begin uh, uh, is by, uh, by conjecturing sort of an imagined notion of time, which is not real time, which is the moment at which uh, the cosmos is created by the divine. Now, Moving on to the, um, the atomic. Um, sorry, I've got a lot of stuff on Avicenna, apologies. Um, there are some really kind of interesting ideas and, and one of the, the, the points here is that we're not entirely sure where this notion of time atoms comes from. Um, in, in the Greek tradition, we certainly have uh, notions of, of atomism and atomic time that you find um, attributed to Democritus, although it's not so clear if it really was by him, by, to Epicurus. <coughs> and you find a critique of it in Damascus as well. Um, but uh, a number of, of people, including the late uh, Shlomo Pinnis, um, famously um, argued that um, atomism in the Islamic tradition seems to have a different kind of trajectory and it has um, a different um, motivation. And the motivation is towards, uh, of course, what is normally called occasionalism. Um, the Democritan um, <coughs> tradition is not terribly interested necessarily in where um, these atoms come from or how they persist and so forth. Um, the Islamic traditions, particularly in the Ashari, the Sunni Ashari theological school, <coughs> are primarily concerned with that. A quick aside, I will maybe put a footnote somewhere about um, atomic time leaps, um, which are really mind-blowing, but I won't talk about them now because I'm really not sure what they even mean. Um, but there's a very famous thinker in the early period, and Nazam, who has this notion of uh, atomic uh, time leaps, um, and there seems to be some uh, dialectical relationship with Damascus on that. 
which again is interesting. I'm quite interested in what happens to later, late Neoplatonism and how that comes into Islam. But in terms of uh, the, uh, the occasionalist notion, and this is somewhere where I think nowadays I know a number of people interested in, in kind of Christian and Muslim interactions on this notion of creatio um, continua, right? Cre continual creation. How it is that God is, is constantly engaged in time. And uh, in the occasionalist uh, view that you find in someone like Ashari and the later <coughs> Ashari theologians, um, time, in a sense, is what we produce to make sense of continuities, sort of phenomenal continuities. But in and of themselves, they don't exist. Because what's actually happening is that um, each, um, each space-time unit, which, we, which I'm using uh, this uh, time atom to describe, um, cannot persist for two instants. It can only persist for one instant. And even then, in a sense, it's not really an instant. Okay. Because it has no creative power uh, and no creative sustainability of its own. What happens is that God has to recreate that time instant every single instant. And so what we do is we perceive phenomenally because we're, we're not even perceiving that we're kind of going in and out of existence or at every instance. We, we perceive a continuity but this is a completely kind of constructed continuity that we've, we've done. And, and it's part of God's mercy that he allows us to see this continuity because, I mean, let's face it, we'll be seriously freaked out if we could see things going in and out of existence at every single moment. I mean, it would probably be a very disturbing existence. Um, so, so there's something phenomenal and created about, uh, and constructed about it. Um, but what's actually happening at this kind of atomic level is that uh, the, the, the time atoms are being uh, recreated constantly. And it's, it's basically trying to emphasize divine creative agency, and it's trying to emphasize the way in which God uh, continually creates, the, the way in which God is continually engaged in what we think is space-time. But in actuality, there is, in a sense, no space-time which is con continuing. It's, it's uh, recreated every single uh, moment, and as I said, um, I think I mentioned earlier, there are some people who are interested in linking this in with quantum kind of views of how the cosmos works, uh, both uh, on on the Christian side and also on the on the Muslim um, side. Now, um, so that's the first part, which I've taken far too long on. Um, let me uh, quickly move on to the Sufi. Uh, 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 context uh, and mention just one idea here. There are a number of possible ideas. But the one idea is this notion of Sufi timelessness. Uh, one of the names which are often used for Sufis, which you find in the med uh, medieval period, is this <coughs> idea of Ibn al-Waqt, the person of um, the time, the moment. And it goes back to this idea that um, humans exist between two points of non-existence, and I can exist, between two points of non-existence and between two points of timelessness. And the first point is what we discussed before, which is the primordial covenant, the Alastu Birabbikum of um, Quran 7, 172. And the second point is the point of judgment. And so, in a sense, the, the totality of the, the, the span of the human life um, or uh, time is, is suspended between these two timeless and non-existent points. And the, the, the job of the Sufi is then to internalize that timelessness and non-existence in every single instance of their lives. Mm. Right? And that's a very interesting idea because that kind of throws time out completely. Um, it doesn't mean that you, don't, you no longer have uh, respect for uh, timings, which I mentioned before, which are not time. So you still have respect for, for ritual timings, but you have respect for ritual timings in the sense that you understand that, that the performance of the ritual connects you to something which is timeless beyond space and time. So that's why, for example, you have the famous metaphor used of um, any act of worship, particularly the act of prayer, is uh, like the, ascension, the ascension of the soul. 
uh, it's predicated on, on the prophet's famous ascension into, into heaven. Um, now, uh, most of what I'll talk about when I do the paper in this section is going to be uh, from Sufi exegesis, so, and there's a lot of interesting discussions precisely on how this works out. Um, there's, uh, there's some interesting uh, notions in Ibn Arabi, who's probably the most famous Sufi uh, in the uh, Dice 1240 on this in particular as well. There's a whole set of ideas of timelessness associated with, with miracles of saints. Uh, probably won't have time to, to discuss that in the paper, but I'll probably put in the footnote um, uh, one of the uh, most common ways in which miracles are discussed in lives of saints is precisely the, the ability to, to um, go beyond space and time. So like things like bilocation and multilocation, um, kind of one form of astral projection, I guess, uh, or like doing something in a timeless manner, sort of moving from one place to somewhere very differently in timeless manner. And again, this all goes back to the, to the, the prophet's ascension, where the, you know, at least in the most literal sense, it's seen as you know, the prophet going from, uh, uh, from, from Medina to Jerusalem to wherever in the same night. And of course, we know physically, uh, temporally, that's just not possible. Um, but it goes back to, to that um, example. In the Shi notions, which are the third um, uh, set which I will discuss, uh, uh, cyclical time comes up. Now, one of the questions here, especially in the Ismaili notions of, of cyclical time, is whether we're really talking about cyclical history. And this is something I'm not entirely decided on quite simply because usually the basic cosmological frame that they use is very um, uh, consistent with the Platonic notion of the th these three levels. Um, these three levels, which in the later period are known as Sarma, the level of the absolute, unchanging, eternal, divine, uh, the, the, the level of existing with time, which is which I call perpetuity, and that's where you have the interaction between immutables and mutables, and you have the level of time as such, which is the level of relationships between different types of mutable uh, beings. Uh, so, so one of the questions I have is to what extent um, is this really about cyclical history? Now within that uh, you have a lot of uh, texts which um, I want to try and work out quite simply because they're very obscure commentaries, there's not much on this, but there are a number of hadith uh, sayings of the Imams in particular uh, the sort of the Shi Imams, both in the Ismaili and the Twelve of Shi tradition, which talk about there being lots of Adams, not just one Adam, lots of Adams. The only other place where I found this in the Islamic traditions is actually in the work of Ibn Arabi, which can, sort of begs the question of where it's coming from. Um, I think it's basically coming from an Ismaili provenance in that, that, that case. Um, and that also raises a very interesting, I, I remember um, my, my wife is a, a biology teacher, so once I was having a conversation with her about um, these many atoms, and she said, yeah, I think I've, I, found the, I found the solution to the evolution issue. <laughs> you know, is this an interesting uh, solution to how we deal with uh, thinking of evolution in a linear, linear manner uh, as conflicting with a linear understanding of the development of the human in a mm -hmm. religious context? Um, so that's something which um, could potentially be um, developed. Um, as I said, in some of the more esoteric Ismaili and even Nusayri Alawi um, uh, conceptions, that becomes even more complicated in terms of how the cyclical nature works. Now, the, uh, the, um, the, the final kind of um, uh, pre-modern uh, uh, set of ideas which I will discuss, uh, which I've worked primarily on, is the ways in which time and creation is worked out in the early modern period. And I'll just mention one uh, particular idea because I'm massively running out of time and I probably already have. Um, and that is one particular solution to the problem of creation which is posited by uh, someone called Mir Damad who dies in 1631, an Iranian philosopher. And uh, he's trying to reconcile the question of whether the cosmos is eternal or whether it's created in time. Now he wants to keep the notion of some real creation, some real gap, so to speak, between God and the creation, but he's perfectly aware that the arguments for the eternity of the cosmos are better arguments. 
than the ones uh, for being created in time. And so he comes up with this idea that if you go back to the three levels of Sarma, the Eternity, Dahar as uh, everlasting perpetuity um, and time, creation actually happens in the middle because the middle level is where you have the interaction between the immutable and the mutable. So that's where God creates. That doesn't mean that he can't create in, in, in uh, time as well, but that's fundamentally where God creates because you have the, fun, the, the issue of uh, God uh, creating just in the material temple realm is problematic because of, it goes back to Aristotle. It's always Aristotle's fault. Because Aristotle has this conception of God, which everyone accepts, you know, God is not material, God does not uh, think like we do, God is not a being like us, so he cannot be intervening like us in, in history. So there has to be uh, some other way of doing it, and that's where he comes up with this notion that it, it happens in Dahar, in perpetuity, in this um, uh, durationless, um, in this duration, this everlasting duration of the middle level. And that also raises some interesting questions about uh, divine um, knowledge. Um, I think we, it might have come up earlier, but um, one of the things I'm interested in, in connecting it with is uh, Christian notions of middle knowledge um, and also even some uh, more recent uh, models of open theism. So how, does it, how is it that we can have this um, omnipotent, omniscient um, creator how do we uh, reconcile that with um, the uh, responsibility of humans for their actions? Okay. Um, and uh, I, I think this is a, a really interesting um, a solution that has. If creation happens in this middle kind of um, everlasting duration, then uh, there is going to be a difference between God's knowledge, this perfect knowledge at the eternal level, and knowledge as it unfolds at that middle level. And it's precisely that knowledge that unfolds at the middle level which appears then to us to be changeable. It's, a, it's sort of an unfolding of uh, a divine um, uh, measuring out um, which then changes and it, it's, it also responds to this, this classic problem that you have, the theological problem is, what's the point of prayer, right? Petitionary prayer. What is the point of petitionary prayer if God is completely unmovable, unchanging, uh, and uh, eternal. Uh, he doesn't change his mind at all. And so one of the ways in which you deal with the problem of petitionary prayer is you put God's knowledge and God's agency with respect to creation at this middle level. And that's precisely what Mir Dhamad is doing. And I'm massively out of time, so I can't talk about Bergson, etc. But that will be the, the, the idea. Um, it's crazy to try and cover everything. Um, it should be obvious where my main interests lie, which are in the philosophical accounts, but um, I will try and bring in the, uh, the esoteric sort of she and some of the Sufi concepts, because I think they're, they're interesting ways in which, ha in which you go beyond certain conventional notions of what time is. Thank you.